Well, good morning and happy new year. Um, we couldn't really be uh, starting a new year. We're going to be studying out characters on Sunday, uh, characters from within the Bible. And of course, I mean, I could have started with God, I suppose, but I decided to start with Adam. All right. And the title of the lesson today is A New Beginning. And there's something exciting about a new beginning, isn't there? Like, you've got to have a new mindset. I know what new beginnings, uh, you know, you've ever gone through. I can actually honestly remember the first day I had consciousness. I actually can. I was four years old, uh, and I remember it. I got out of my bed. I went, this is familiar, but unfamiliar. And I walked out of my room and at the top of the stairs. And I actually, at four years old, I can remember that moment. I've got a very pictorial mind. But you go, well, that's a bit weird. Well, that's who I am. Amen. But uh, imagine being Adam, waking up fully grown. Now, there are a lot of movies, you know, Suddenly 30 or something like that, you know, and they sort of go, oh my goodness, or if you're in Lord of the Rings, the Urukai who suddenly wakes up and goes, oh, what's going on? But imagine being Adam, never having sinned. He doesn't even know what sin is. Never having hurt anybody or being hurt by anybody, and you're an adult. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I'm 56 years old and nobody's ever hurt me. You go like, well, which world have you been living in? It was a completely new beginning. Not only was it a new beginning for him, it was a new beginning for God. This was God's first human. He was the guinea pig. Sometimes we feel like we're God's guinea pigs, don't you? But that was what happened to Adam. Everything was new, fresh, adventurous. Imagine him waking up and looking at a flower and going, and then seeing something move. Maybe a lizard going, what the heck was that? Now remember, he hadn't named anything yet, so he was just like, hmm, hmm, hmm. You know, it was an adventure. Imagine what would have been going through his head. You know, Adam was the first zoologist. A zoologist is somebody that gives animals names, all right? So he, wa- he had a profession right at the beginning. Adam, the zoologist. Jeremy, I thought you'd like that little insight there. <laughs> um, the first landscape gardener, okay? Placed gardens and took care of it, all right? Adam had no parents. They could, hey, he didn't have any daddy issues. There was nobody to blame, okay? Can you remember? No, no, he had no friends. And he wasn't sad about it. He was the father of the human race. An instant legend. Hi, what's your name? Adam. That's it for the rest of his life. He was a legend. The first human father. Adam was the first person made in the image of God. And the first human to share an intimate, personal relationship with God. And what would have been amazing is, is he wouldn't have thought that that was weird. You know, so many people, when we talk about our relationship with God, they go, you're just talking like a madman. For him, it was just normal. All there was, was the world he lived in and his relationship with God. Paradise. That is what paradise is. The world that we live in and a relationship with God with none of all the other junk. Then the adventure started. Okay, this is who I am. My arms work like this and my legs work like this. And God put him to work. Genesis 2, 15. The Lord took, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. So for all of you teenagers out there that are still resisting the fact that it's possible to live life without ever working, I'm sorry, we were created to work. Okay. God found Adam a mate. All right. A suitable helper, all right? Then later God gave him a family. Let me just encourage you. It is far better to let God find you a mate. How do I know that that's true? Well, the world tries to do it, and it's a disaster. I don't know if you ever started watching um, those uh, document, or that sort of show documentary, which was Married at First Sight. And it says, a panel of experts has got together, all right, and decided this is your perfect mate. And how many of them succeed? It's like minimal, 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 minimal. 
That's the perfect expert. And believe me, your mum is not a perfect expert. Your dad is not a perfect expert. Your best mate is definitely not a perfect expert. There is only one expert, and that is God. And I so much appreciate him being in my life giving me Kerry. He had to move me from a city called Birmingham to London and said, you are working with Kerry. And everybody else on staff was married. So we sort of went, this is the one single sister on staff. It was pretty obvious. She looked at me, I looked at her, and you went, this is a fix-up. And then you get all those rebellious feelings like, I don't like being set up, all right? Because you go, I want to be in control of my life. But let me tell you, in this area, you don't want to be in control of your life. Genesis 2.18 said, The Lord said, It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. There was no shame in their life, just joy. Freedom to live as long as they did not disobey the few rules God had given them. You would all be easy, man. You have everything. There, I mean, there is every, you can do whatever you want, you can move this tree from here, you can make a garden however you want, you can build a house wherever you want, live in a cave, not live in a cave. I've just got a couple of things you can't do. You say, that's pretty easy, right? No. <laughs> you know, we need to have a new mindset. When we become Christians, we have the opportunity to have that Adam moment, to replace our past with a new beginning, a fresh start. And it's amazing. I became a Christian at 23, and I was pretty disgusted and shocked at my own life at how much sin I had done by 23. It wasn't like I was 50. By 23, I'd go, man, I've done stuff I am so ashamed of. We have the opportunity to have our sins washed away and never to be held against us ever again. Do you know how many people would die with that feeling? Just go, you know what, I wish I could have a relationship with somebody and I could be open about my life and I could say, you know what, there's nothing bad in my life anymore. And yet people can't, which is why relationships break down because they're starting on deceit. I don't want to tell them who I really was or am. You know, we have the opportunity to get a new family to replace our imperfect parents or family. It's funny speaking to a lot of people at, uh, about Christmas. They go, yeah. I went home for three days. That was enough. By the third day, I was like, get me out of here. I want to get back. You know, I don't think that's an unfamiliar uh, feeling for many of us. It's like, because all they do is they complain about their health. They complain about each other, about their relatives, about how bad this was, about how they don't have enough money, or they do have too much money, or the guy next door has more money than me, and that's unfair. And non-Christians are so negative. You know, and then they can't complain, well, I bought a bigger present for this person and they didn't give me a present. You go, geez, where's the joy in life? You know, we become perfect in God's eyes as we are clothed in Christ. This is my favorite verse on grace, Galatians 3.26. And if you understand this verse, you actually get grace completely. It's talking about how God views us after we get baptized. In Galatians 3.26, it says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So he's going, you know, when you get baptized, you put on a, a, a piece of cloth, and that cloth is Jesus Christ. So when God looks at you, he's not looking at you, he's looking at Jesus Christ. So if I was bare-chested up here and I had all scars and pus and, and all sort of stuff, and I was preaching, you go, Jesus, I bet we should put a shirt on, then I could listen to him. Well, literally, if I then just dressed nicely, you, you wouldn't know what's going on underneath, but you would look at me as if I had a perfect chest. In the same way, God looks at us and he sees Jesus. So when he looks at us, and that's our confidence we have when we pray to him, God, thank you for answering this prayer because I'm perfect in your eyes. Not that I am perfect, but I am perfect in your eyes. Yeah. And that's why people argue about, well, you don't need to be baptized to be saved. Well, then how can we come into God's presence? And so today, that's how God views you, perfect in his eyes. Like you're brand new. Like this is your Adam moment. Now, we never stop being perfect in God's eyes as long as we walk in the light. 1 John 1, 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. 
we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So going back to that sort of cloth, that t-shirt, over Christmas, I know some of you dribbled, right? Okay, you sort of had a nice wear shirt on and a bit dribbled here and a bit dribbled. There's a few crumbs here. Jordan's laughing because obviously he did it a lot. Okay, and, uh, but it's a little bit like this. You know, the sin comes on the cloth of Jesus and you just, you flick it off. He goes, as long as you admit it's there, you look down and go, oh, I've sinned. Oh, uh, let, oh do you see that? Do you, you see that? Have I got it all? Have I got, let me talk about it. Have I, you spend a moment focusing on the sin and go, have I got it all? Brandon goes, no, I want to have a look at your sin. Okay, right. okay, you've got it all. And maybe there's a little bit you need to get in some bleach and really get it out or something. But then you put it back on and go, no, my shirt's good to go. The issue that stops us from claiming that Adam feeling every day is us. No one else. That's the lies of Satan. It's us. We must not live in our past, which is where most people live. People with daddy issues, mummy issues, they're living in the past. You can't change the past, all right? You can't change the future in many ways, but your mind is what keeps you there. If you don't think about the past, it's gone. Philippians 3.13 says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Matthew read this scripture out yesterday. He talked about how, you know, too many of us are straining towards the past. We want to keep reliving the past. You don't understand. If you had my past, then you'd understand where my present is. He's going, forget it. Don't strain into your past. And we're forgetting what's good in the future. That's the opposite way. Hey, we've got to forget the past and strain towards what's going to be good this year. You know, you cannot become all you need to if you are still attached to who you have been. If you just walk around going, I'm a failure, I'm a failure, I'm a failure, you'll continue to be a failure. But if you fail, which is the way of life, and go, I did fail that exam, but now I'm going to pass it, then life changes. You must have a clear picture of who God wants you to be and hold on to it with everything you have. You know, I appreciate, you know, Emma beating up her boyfriend, Matthew, in the welcome, a bit like that, you know. But, and I appreciate, you know, she, she loves him, so she's just hitting him a little bit. Believe me, those punches are going to come a lot harder. And you've got to be ready for it, not from Emma. No, okay, all right. <laughs> but life is going to hit you hard. You know, point one, just two clear points today. Point one, we have everything for a blessed life. Everything. You don't need anything else but God. Genesis 1.26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit in it with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it. I give every green plant for food, and so it was. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. You know, we are created in God's image. He didn't make a mistake with you. I know that may surprise you, some of you, but he didn't. It means that inhumans are the image of God in their moral, spiritual, and intellectual state. Accordingly, humanity is unique amongst all God's creatures, having both the material body and an immaterial soul and spirit. So my dog has a spirit. Sometimes it's a bit snappy. But my dog does not have a soul. My dog does not sit there and go, I wonder why I was created. It may think, where's the next meal coming from? But that's about it. In simplest terms, it means that we were made to resemble God. To be godly in the way that we think and in the way that we act. 
being God-like spiritually. So there is a call for us to be spiritual. Why? Well, here is so that Adam could rule. Rule over the world with a God-like attitude. That was his purpose. You're made in his image to rule the world. Later, for man to rule over woman with a God-like attitude. And the sisters always want to marry somebody with a God-like attitude. You know, Genesis 3.6 says your desire will be for a husband and he will rule over you. So some sister goes, I, I don't want a husband. That's not true. I know so because my Bible tells me so. It says God has put inside every one of you the desire for a husband. Now, somebody may have damaged that desire, but that damage needs to get healed. If we are created to be spiritual in order to rule, then it goes without saying that in order to rule as God intended, we must be spiritual. Leading with love, joy, kindness, peace. Let me ask you today, are you at peace in your soul, in your marriage? in your ministry. If you come into 2024 still not at peace, you need to sort that out. Galatians 2.22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envy each other. So if we are to have responsibility, we're meant to do it in a godly way. We are created to rule, to rule the world, but rule the world with a godly mindset. If we are unspiritual when we lead, then we don't create paradise, as God intends, in our relationships, in our homes, in our ministries, in our friendships. You know, there is nothing better than a great friendship. There just isn't. We had Emmanuel and Effie come and stay with us at Christmas. It was just fun. And uh, my daughter and her boyfriend, who aren't Christians, said over Christmas, he said, you know, Emmanuel has to be one of the greatest personalities I've ever met in my life. He's just like, I love having him over. And to have a friend that you can come and live with you over Christmas that has that sort of impact on your family members and the boyfriend of your, of your daughter, you're like... That's what it means. He has an impact because he's spiritual. You know, the opposite of paradise is hell on earth. Torture, horror. Do you know how many people wake up feeling like, I hope I don't see that person. I just, I just hope I don't see that person. They're not at peace. So they spend their whole life trying to avoid somebody. And it just eats them up. God wants to bless us. I think many of us go between one or two things. We're either the self-accused, God would never want to bless me, or we walk around going, hey, I'm just pretty awesome and God should bless me. I think there are more of us in the first category, <laughs> the insecure Garrett category, than the other. But you've really got to understand, God didn't create Adam and go, right, I'm going to make your life hell. I'm going to really enjoy this. But you know, that's how some of us view God. God just wants to make my life hell. That's it. I was just born on the wrong side of God. It says he blessed Adam and Eve. It is one of Satan's lies for us to believe that God doesn't want a great life for us. It's in God's nature to bless his people. That's who he is, to give them resources. Not just give them a few, but endless resources. If we are godly and take care of them. So you think about it, God gave Adam and Eve the whole world. If God wants us to evangelize the world, he'll figure out the money for special contribution. He'll figure out the people to raise up and lead. He'll figure out this. He'll figure out the buildings. I think as a young man, I kept going, oh, I've got to fix this. Yet as I got older, I realized this is God's problem. It's actually not my problem. So if we lose a venue, I go, well, that's God's problem. That's not my problem. That's his problem. You know, people go, well, how are you going to raise up and send out three churches last year? I said, I haven't got a clue, but it's just not my problem. So, well, aren't you stressing about it? I said, I would if it was my problem, but it's God's problem. Too often when we take on God's problem to our life, we feel so overwhelmed because you're trying to lift a rock that only God can lift. You know, are you known for taking care of those that God gives you? That's the real issue, isn't it? He's like, don't try and take care of what God hasn't given you. What about the people he has? 
the people in your personal life, your Bible talk, your household, for us, my wife, my kids. You know, what about your ministry spiritual lives? Well, that's his problem. We're always rescuing each other. We're always feeling like today, I really want to really go out and pray lots. Well, grab somebody and take them with you because maybe they don't. Do you really love those you reach out to? I know I, I've got Matthew here and I'm training him from Hong Kong. I'm just really trying to teach him as you meet people, to really connect with people, to really love people that you meet. And so we met this gentleman, he was from um, Inner Mongolia, and I was trying to talk to him about Inner Mongolia, and then I got with Lan, and she's from Inner Mongolia, and I found out where she's from, and I text him, and then I met another guy from uh, China yesterday, and his English was a bit broken, so I got with Brooke, and I said, this is what I want to say, so he typed it up in Chinese, and he, he sent it to me, and then I sent it to him, and you know, I'm trying to make this guy feel comforted, feel loved, because he's, he's just moved here a couple of weeks ago, and for, from his point of view, I, I could just be like this crazy old English man, so we've really got to go above and beyond to try and make people feel loved. Do you love your household? You know, God, we, we go, no, you know, this household, I shouldn't be in this household. My Bible said God arranges the exact times and places for you to live. <laughs> he put you in there. You go, well, I don't want to be there. That's why he put you in there to serve for something. You know, do you love your household? It is terrible if you come home to a household and you don't enjoy. And that, that's just the worst feeling. You know, you sort of drive around afterwards and walk around, do I have to go home? You have to go home and sort that out. Do you love your spouse? I love my spouse. I love Kerry. Do you love your home? I love the fact our daughter goes, she loves living at home. That's how people should feel. Are you an inspiration to those around you? Does it attract people to God? You know, you are God to many people. When they view you, you are the face of the church. Okay, so when you have a, a retail store, an Apple store or a Nike store, that represents whatever product it is. You are that product. So if you go out unshaven, looking a bit shabby and go, hey, would you like to know about Jesus? Well, I did, but looking at you, I don't think so. <laughs> that's a bit rough, but that is how people think. God wants us to be fruitful and increase in number. The harvest is plentiful. It always has been and always will. If you buy into the thought process that the world doesn't want to love Jesus. There are 8 billion people out there. There are people every day who cry out, God, help me. Matthew 9, 37 says, he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are the few. The truth of it is, is evangelism and meeting people, it's just hard work. You can go for five hours and not meet a single person. That doesn't mean there aren't people out there. It just means you have to look further. No, it's just a matter of harvesting in a godly way. Otherwise, we gain nothing. People often go, you know, why is it that I work so hard and I feel like as a Christian, I gain nothing? It's really easy. It's because you're unloving. You go, well, I work hard. Hard work does not necessarily make somebody else feel loved. I know that because I have cleaned our house sometimes and made more of a mess and made more of a problem for Kerry that she has to clean more than if I hadn't have touched anything, all right? So actually doing it the correct way makes a really big difference. I don't know if any of you brothers, married brothers, have ever put a piece of your clothing in with uh, one of your wife's clothing and it comes out a different color. And you go, well, I really tried my hardest, okay? These are the sort of things in relationships. Corinthians 13 says, if I, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So you actually have to make people feel loved, not try and make them feel loved. You see, us men, let me just talk to men a little bit. We don't like asking for instructions, do we? So this is one of my pet peeves is, you know, when Kerry puts things in a, in a, for washing, she reads every label, okay? And it goes, well, it needs to be in this type of water and this type of color and don't mix with everything. The men just open the door and shove everything in, right? <laughs> That's what we do. And that's why we walk around hurting people, because we actually don't read their instructions. We don't walk up to people and go, How, what makes you feel loved? And so we need to start reading into people's and listening to people a little bit more. You know, it also takes hard work to bear fruit because of man's sin. Genesis 3:17 says, to Adam he said, curse is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food and from it all the days of your life. So really, why doesn't God just pull into the church everybody that wants to become a Christian? 
Because then we would have so much free time, we would sin enormously. That's the truth. Because that's what we do with our spare time, is sin. So it makes it a challenge to keep us occupied, to build us up. Now, when we follow God's plan for the world, life is good. If you have the right mindset for 2024, it will go well. If you don't, it won't. When we lead in a godly fashion, when men rule and women follow eagerly, when our marriages are spiritual, when we eagerly accept responsibility of leadership, when we focus on being fruitful and increasing in number, we shouldn't ever feel awkward about asking another brother or sister, hey, were you evangelizing this week? Who are you studying the Bible with? That's just who we are. Then life is good. Let me ask you, was this past year good for you? It's great to see Aaron and Hanley are back. He goes, life is pretty good. You know, I said to her in the fellows, I said, she, you're still smiling. She said, he, he, he. <laughs> good job, Aaron. Okay. <laughs> um, but life is good. He's came in, he said, I'm happy to be in the, you know, Lord of the, 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 the fellowship of the rings. You know, he's looking forward to his first marriage talk in a couple of weeks and stuff like that. Have an honest review of your life. How was your health last year? How was your marriage? You know, how were your relationships with your peers? Were you fruitful? Without doubt, last year, I look back at who Kerry and I helped become a Christian. Our biggest impact was obviously in Samoa on our personal level, to see Tanner, Thomas, Patrick, to see Jack up here and send him off, you know. And, you know, it's funny how you give and it gets, you know, you get given back to. So Jack, he went off on our Samoa mission team. He actually looked after our house for a week while we went away. And Kerry's comment was that he was better than any sister. All right, the house was clean, all right, the dog was walked and happy. And in fact, the dog ignored me when I got back because I think she was like, where's Jack? I prefer Jack. <laughs> you know, if life wasn't good, ask yourself why. For the church, it was a great year. The world sector grew by 20%. We sent out three churches, and now we're what's left. All right, so back again. <laughs> you know, if it wasn't great, what are you going to do about it? Can you identify what went wrong last year? And are you going to make it great this year? Point two, learn from Adam's mistakes. You know, there are always mistakes. In Genesis 3, verse 6, it says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for, some, for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig trees together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I command you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, Why is it you have, what is it you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. So what was Adam's great mistake? He teamed up with Eve to bring sin into the world. Instead of leading Eve, he fell into sin with her. Genesis 3, 17 says, to Adam he said, could you listen to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat it. Nearly all sins, in, in, in nearly all sins, people look to have a relationship with people who encourage them to sin. Now, sometimes we can do this with a good heart. I remember when we first started the church, some brothers were struggling with impurity and said, well, let's have a, a, a group chat to encourage each other. And all it ended up doing was them confessing sin to each other, and they did it more and more. That is not a sort of thing you need to be doing. If you are weak in a sin, you need to pay yourself up with somebody who's strong in that, not somebody who's weak. Alcoholics don't get with other alcoholics and go, hey, you hold me accountable. That, that's, that's, that doesn't work, okay? Because they go, well, I'm really struggling with it. Me too. Should we have one? No. Your peers reflect that. Who you tell your innermost thoughts to are your real peers. You go, well, I'm a leader and my peers are the Bible taught leaders. Oh, are they the people you hang out with? Are there people that really challenge you? Your peers are who you really open up to. And some people go, well, I don't want to open up to leadership because I feel like I'll be challenged. So you're, in that moment, you are choosing weak peers. You know, are your peers weak, unchallenging people 
who empathize with your sin, or are they people that are hard line and righteous people that help you change? If you want to get better, you can surround yourself with people that are stronger than you. Adam avoided responsibility and blamed others. The victim mentality. Genesis 3.12. The man said, the woman you put me here, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. First rule of all marriage. You come with a marriage counselor, you, you won't believe what my wife has done and why I'm in sin. Okay, so she's made you sin, has she? Yes, absolutely. Oh, really? So sin comes, your sin comes from her heart. That's not what my Bible teaches. First, he blamed God for the people and the situation God put him in. It is amazing how God can put you in paradise and you can tell him it's not paradise. Think about the first world. We have everything, don't we? Go to a chemist if you've got an illness. You go here, you lose a job, and the government gives you money for not having a job. Okay, you know, you, you bang into a car and there's automatic insurance. And the world's terrible. I can't believe it. And we just pray. We are so ungrateful as human beings. And we just want somebody to blame. Then he blamed the people around him. In this case, his spouse. God, it's your fault. And it's your fault. You gave me this woman and then it's her fault. We should never blame God and others for our failings and sin. If you want to know who's going to be the biggest problem in your life in 2024, just look in a mirror. <laughs> look in a mirror. That's the real problem. Adam then chose to hide from God rather than confront his mistakes and his sin. It's an amazing thing, isn't it, that we still think we can hide from God. We can come to church and we can sing and we can praise God and we're in sin and we think we're hiding from God because no other man knows. You know, rather than running to God in humility and seeking help, he thought God would not find out where he was or come looking for him. There was only two people in this world, all right? So when God walked through the Garden of Eden and he didn't see him, he went, I wonder where Adam and Eve are. Do you know, it wasn't like there were five million people. He went, oh yeah, I'll catch up with them tomorrow. You know, he went there expecting to find them. We can't hide from God. We can't hide our sin from God. He wants your sin to come into the light so that you will deal with it. Adam made excuses rather than admitting the truth. In 1 Timothy 2.13 it says, For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. So here's the thing. Adam was actually not deceived by Eve. He wasn't. He chose to sin. He knew exactly what he was doing. The sins you must deal with in your life are not the ones that are deceiving you. They're the ones you know. Discipling will help you see the other ones. But everybody comes into this room, and if I look at you and I go, okay, every single one of you has a sin that you don't want to change. You already know what that sin is, right? I've just pointed you like, what, who does he know? I don't know. It's you that really knows. Adam was not deceived. Galatians 5.19 says, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Your sins are obvious to you. And if they're not, just ask your flat tonight, hey, what are my sins? They'll make it really obvious to you. They're the sins you must deal with. Let me ask you, are you heading to be kicked out of paradise? Every year we say, we come back at Christmas and we're going to lose some people. And every year we always do. We didn't intend. Sometimes they're a big surprise to you. But the question is, are you heading to be kicked out of paradise? Let me ask you, which friends and relationships do you need to cut off in your life? There are people in your life that are negative, unspiritual, they may be long-term friends, and they need to go. I think about how the Bible says, bad company corrupts the character. You go, well, but they're my friend. Think about what that actually means, corrupting your character. So if a politician becomes corrupt, it because he gets around other politicians, he goes, yeah, that's not the way we do it. You know, in order to make this happen, you've got to bribe this person. And here is a man that maybe became a politician out of pure integrity and wanting to change the world. But somebody else got in his ear and persuaded him he couldn't have integrity. 
I remember my last boss that I worked for in the world, he said, you need to prove to me that you can be successful in business without lying, because I don't believe it's true. And I had to make a decision. Was money more important than my integrity? I'm glad to say I chose integrity, and then God blessed me. But what about you? How is your integrity? What about ex-girlfriends? Sometimes we just need to let people of the opposite sex go. Sometimes you see that even that my girlfriend right now, I, they just need to go. They're, they're not helping me spiritually. Some of us, it's family. People go back for two weeks. They visit their family and they go, they come back. The Holy Spirit has left them and they're just like, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. That's, as, that's how quickly you can go, a couple of weeks. Who do you need to stop blaming for your sin? Are you still blaming your parents? You know, people go through this point where you grow up and you idolize your parents, then you demonize your parents, then you realize that they're just another pair of human beings with faults. But are you still blaming your parents for who you are? Maybe you're blaming your discipler. Maybe you're blaming the church. Let me just understand, when you slander the church, you're slandering the body of Christ, which means you're slandering Christ himself. Are you blaming your leaders? If I had a better leader, my Bible says Jesus is your leader. Jesus is your leader. You're called to follow Jesus. You know, while you blame others, nothing changes. You think it's a valid excuse to not change. What sin or sins do you need to bring into the light? What about your laziness? Do you just don't get up and have your quiet times? Who do you think that hurts? It's only hurting you and God. It doesn't hurt me. Now, it may hurt me if you're unspiritual and you're rude to me. But you've got to be open about your laziness. What about pornography? You know, pornography corrupts your soul. It's sexual immorality. Somebody asked me, is pornography sexual immorality? Well, if Jesus says when you lust at a woman, you are adulterous, then pornography is absolutely sexually immoral. And we kick people out of the church for sexual immorality. I saw one guy said, well, my parents said it's natural. For your sinful nature, it may be, but it's not spiritual. We don't watch Game of Thrones. We don't watch that stuff. All right. On Facebook, you don't start pressing things of half-naked women in bikinis and go, it's not pornography. She's got a few pieces of clothes on. That's pornography. What about your debt? You know, some of us, we want to blame. Well, I worked for a guy that I knew didn't pay people, and that's why I'm in debt. Well, you're in debt because you made a bad decision. All right, but I hoped. We need to take responsibility where our finances are at. You know, well, my finances would be great if I hadn't crashed my car. When you get a car, you need to put money aside for when you crash it. Not if you crash it, for when you crash it. What are areas you need to stop making excuses in? Your studies, your relationships. I'm so weak. Get strong. Get strong. All right. A lot of us have had injuries, right? Knee injuries or whatever. You don't go, well, that's it. My leg's gone for life. I'm just flat. It's just weak. Just weak. That's it. I just, I heard it when I was two and just, you know, I'm going to wobble for the rest of my life. Some of us, that's what we like. We're like, well, somebody wounded me last year and they said I was ugly. And then I just don't think I can ever date, for honestly. But honestly, we can be so weak, get strong. All right? You can't change the future unless you change. One of the things that really helped me, uh, about two years after I'd become a Christian, I came into the church, did really well, had a girlfriend, came into the ministry, went through some challenge times, and then I came out. And very often as a young Christian, you go, here are my dreams. I want to get married. I want to go in the ministry. And that's like the pinnacle of my life. And you buy into that. So here I was, two years after I was a Christian, coming out of the ministry, no girlfriend. And I'm like, now, now what's my ambition in life? And that's, you sort of see how selfishly ambitious I was, rather than my, my goal was. But, and I remember coming to a conference, and so many of the lessons were about, you want to go in the ministry? You want to go on a mission team? And I'm like, nah, I mean, I've been there, done that. And I had to come in, I had to make a decision. I'm going to listen to every lesson as if I had just been baptized. And I remember there was a class going, do you want to go in the ministry? And I thought, I've been there, done it. Now, hold on. If I was a young Christian, I'd be going to that class. So I went. And my mindset changed. And as a result, my life changed. I no longer 
judge my future but by my past. I judge my future as if I had just been baptized. You know, maybe you need to ask God just to surrender your soul to where it needs to go today. See, our scripture, the reason I've chosen the scripture is, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Matthew 5.8. You know, the only thing I want, I want the church to grow to 100. I want to send out, you know, more mission teams. I want to do all that. But more than anything, I want a great relationship with God this year. I just, you know, I'm reading through the Bible chronologically. I've got onto that and some other things as well. I just want to go out and have really great times with God. And to be honest, at the end of the year, if nothing happens in my life, but I felt like I had a great relationship with God, I'm good with that. But I know that's not how it works. If you're close with God, God uses you. But sometimes if you try and achieve too much, you can bend your relationship with God out of place. Now, some of us are like caterpillar Christians. You ever watch a caterpillar? It sort of goes, bluff, bluff. We actually need a metamorphosis so that we can fly as a, a caterpillar. The great thing about Adam is, credit to him, eventually he changed. There is no record of him not leading his wife ever again. He messed up once, he got it, he was discipled, he went, right, it's my job to lead my wife. There's no record of him sinning ever again. He went, been there, done that, don't want to do that again. There is no record of him being bitter against his wife and embittering his children. He went on to fulfill God's purpose for his life and bear fruit and much fruit. Genesis 5.3 says, when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image. And he named him Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived a total of 930 years and then he died. Adam went on to do something great. He learned from his mistakes. He could have walked around and went, man, I blew it for the whole of mankind. But no, he went, you know what? I blew it once. I learned my lesson and I moved on. You know, I appreciate Beth being up here and going, you know what? Last year I had a runaway. I had to go and deal with my heart. But she hasn't run away again. It wasn't like I was Jonah on, you know, in June, and then I visited another Jonah beach in July and, and August and September. It was like, I've done it. Messed up. That's it. It's done. Appreciate Jack. Jack got restored. Off he goes on the mission team. You know? I, I wanna, really do want to commend uh, Aaron and Hanley's wedding. That was the most unworldly wedding I've ever been to. I was supremely impressed. Supremely impressed. I think about Terry, you know, had to be rescued, you know, floundered, and I don't want to come back, Joe. You're not going to make me come back. Now he's leading his Bible talk, you know. I think about Gabe. Took him a couple of years to, you know, get it together, but he's here early. He's helping out. He's fired up. He's like, here I come. What can I do? You know, I know Jacques watching. He's got COVID with a couple of people. I heard, you know, at the baptism. He was a guy that through COVID, and I'm sure there are a lot of other people out there, they got isolated, fell into sins and addictions, and I'm sure there's many more people out there that we don't even know about, decided to deal with the sin, some addiction as is, became a Christian. And I heard at the, um, at the, baptist at the baptism, his parents were so proud of the changes that he made. This is a man at 27. He'd you know, gone along a life and then really fallen down for a couple of years. But this is his new year. It's like, man, this is the year. And I've actually been incredibly impressed about how he's dealt with his sin. You know, a new beginning. You've got to believe you have everything for a blessing. Absolutely everything. There is nothing more that you need than a relationship with God. And then learn from Adam's mistakes. Learn from your mistakes. Don't be who you were in 2024. 2024 is so full of many possibilities. It is our spiritual garden of Eden. What waits you is God's victories and love. You know, we've got so much to look forward to even in the church. We've got our January retreat next year, and I hear there's now a Mahjong competition, and we've got to sort out the rules and all sorts of things. We've got the incredible marriage retreat, and then uh, even on the little uh, one-note schedule, I've put all the conference and everything that's going on there. But I, I want to leave you with a scripture in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. It says, however, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for us, for those who love him. You know, your goals, your do-it list, your dream list is nothing compared to what God will do. Let's have a great 2024. Amen. <laughs> 
To hear more from Dr. Joe Willis, check out his two books on Amazon, The Art of Spiritual Warfare, Practicals for Becoming a Prayer Warrior, and Money is the Answer for Everything. Click the links in the description below. Also, for more life-changing lessons, subscribe to his YouTube channel, Dr. Joe Willis.